Father, we thank you this morning for our time here. I thank you for each and every person. And uh, Father, like the Apostle Paul prayed for the church in Colossians chapter 1, that each person would be filled with the knowledge of your will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding so that we can walk worthy of everything that you've called us to, that you're strengthening us by the inner man, that you're revealing things to us, that you're going to speak to each person today in that unique way that you do by the Holy Spirit. So what I say, the Holy Spirit will speak to each one of them that make it personal and private for their life. Father, we thank you again for your word and we thank you for the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ, and what a difference he has made in our life and how we can go out and change the world because of what he's done. We thank you for that in the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Many years ago when we met Pastor J.B. Whitfield, which has probably been, I don't know, more than 15 years now, and then we eventually went and ministered at, at their church, Agape Faith Church in North Carolina. And Pastor JB, you know, he's, he's a cheerleader. He's, a, he's a jumping and dancing and running and shouting. And uh, I'm not that way. <laughs> Too much. I told their congregation, I said, you know, Pastor JB is one of these guys that you just like instantly fall in love with. He's just got that kind of spirit. I have to grow on you just a little bit. <laughs> so I'm a little quieter. I have been teaching Bible school for almost 30 years, and you know, we get used to teaching. And so the preaching gift isn't something that happens to me very often. It's nice when it does, but mostly I teach. And so I will give you something to shout about the rest of your life yeah. from God's Word, all right? All right, at least that's the way I, say, I see it. I am what I have, uh, I don't know if this is a real term or not, but I call myself a conversational teacher. We'll just talk to each other a little bit and we'll find some things out about God's word. Um, I, I'll just give you just a short background. I did get saved at 17 years old, just a week after I graduated from high school. I, I had almost become an atheist. And uh, I grew up in a home with an alcoholic mother and a workaholic father. I don't know which one caused which, but that's the way it was. And uh, so, you know, there was, we were a dysfunctional family. Probably many people understand that. Michelle grew up when her father was a, a surgeon. He was a doctor. And he was an atheist until shortly before he died. Uh, and, but her mother was a fanatic. So we told our kids that you had four grandparents and one of them was really good. And that was her mother. Uh, the others got saved later and the kids really never got to know them as Christians really, but our, our kids. But so Michelle's mother was, uh, was a fanatic and a good, in a good way. And she helped change that little town that she grew up in of about 5,000 people. Everybody knew Dr. Morris's wife. And uh, she had, so she had a reputation, but it was good. She loved people, she helped people, she prayed for people. She changed people's lives because she didn't give up on them because she prayed for them. And uh, so we told our kids that, um, you know, we're, we, we didn't grow up in the best possible way and Michelle and I are coming together and, you know, having you and we're gonna do the best we can. If you find any gaps that we, we might have had in your life, it's your grandparents' fault. <laughs> so uh, now our kids don't have that excuse, do they? Because uh, so far we, are, we have three children and two of them are married, one isn't. And the two that are married, married absolutely wonderful Christian people, also both brought up in ministers' families. And uh, so they have a chance to raise kids better than we raise them. Amen. I like this saying, you know, what God did for us in Christ far outweighed any damage done by Adam or by you. Right? What God did for us in Christ far outweighs any damage done by Adam or by you. That's a good saying, isn't it? God did some great things through Christ for us, and it's, it's life-changing things. It's eternal things, but it's also things that can change our life here. 
Um, today I want to talk about, we're going to primarily look in the book of Nehemiah. We'll get there in a while. You don't have to turn there yet because we'll look at something else. But I want to look at Nehemiah because he was a builder. And uh, he, God gave him an assignment. And we're going to walk through the early part of that assignment because it, it not only shows us something God did in, for Nehemiah and the Israelites, but also how he can work in our life how we can build better in our life and how we can build people. So we'll get there to that in a minute, but uh, I wanna go a few other places first and, and I'll explain why. How many of you have small children or had small children or you were a small child at one time? <laughs> Who's seen a child? There we go, yeah. Well. And if you remember, if you're around children when they're small, what is one of the questions they ask all the time? Why? Right? And sometimes they just keep going, why, 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 no matter what you answer. And there's no more explanation. You've answered everything you know about why. But it's a good question. And I think it's um, one that even as adults, we should continue to ask why. And because we want to know the root reason of why some things are happening. And uh, sometimes it seems like life tries to take that away from you to ask why. That it's not appreciated sometimes when you're adult if you ask why. But I think that we should be the kind of thinkers that are asking the questions, why? I ask it all the time. And sometimes, you know, in, like in, uh, in Oklahoma, where, where we've been the last year and a half or so, um, I, when I go, to the, I go to the doctor once a year and get a blood test. And you know, they, do, they look for some things just to make sure everything's okay, right? And uh, so when I, I, you usually have to go to the doctor's office and pick up a form and then go to the lab where they take your blood. So I didn't wanna to go to the doctor's office, I just wanted to go straight to the lab. And uh, so I just went in there and said, hey, I wanna get a blood test. And they're like, where's your doctor's form? I said, I don't have a doctor's form. I said, it's my blood and I'm paying for it. So why can't I get a, my blood tested? And she smiles and uh, she goes, well, because you can't. I said, but why? I said, is it, is it a company policy or is it a law? She says, I don't know. <laughs> uh, and I'm thinking, how do you work here and not know that? So anyhow, they wouldn't let me. I had to go to the doctor, get the form, come back. And uh, so then uh, I asked the nurse, I said, why can't I get a blood test by myself without, doctors, uh, without a doctor's form? She smiled and says, I don't know, you should ask the doctor that. I said, I will. So when I saw the doctor, I said, doctor, why can't I get a, um, a blood test without you signing it? He goes, I don't know, that's a good question. <laughs> so far, nobody knows, but we can't do it. Right? So you, sometimes you keep asking why, and I'm sure that I could look up the law or look up the company policy, but anyhow, so why is a good question. And I think there are some why questions that every believer should ask because it, it helps us in, uh, to know why we're here. Um, a question about why am I on the earth? You know, you could think, well, because my parents gave, you know, had me. Well, that is a reason. But is that the biggest reason? Even if you weren't planned by your parents, you weren't a surprise to God. You, there is nobody here that was a surprise to God. That no matter your, whether your parents planned you or you came around for whatever reason, by the, when the moment that conception happened, because God was God, he had to place an assignment on your life. Something that you were created to do and a person you were created to be. Whether you ever figure that out or not, God placed it there on your life. And so we sometimes go through life and, try and, and we, discover, we look to discover that. And, and people that don't discover their purpose for being on the earth try all sorts of things. They try to fill it with alcohol or fame or drugs or something else. But none of that ever takes the place of the assignment that God has put on your life. So it's a question then, why am I here? Why am I here? And what is God doing in my life? Do we, can we put things together? Can we do the math 
and see what God is doing in our life. Before I was saved, I had come to three conclusions when I was 15 years old. I'll tell you what they are, but remember, I was 15 and unsaved. But here were my three conclusions. Number one, money in and of itself will not make you happy. Now, why did I come to that conclusion? Because my dad made a lot of money and we lived in an absolutely beautiful place on a lake. You couldn't, you couldn't wish for anything nicer. Except, you know what we didn't have? Love. No love in our home. So we lived in a really beautiful place, but we didn't have anything that would make it a home. So that was my number one conclusion, that money in and of itself won't make you happy. Nothing wrong with money, but don't chase it if you think that's what's gonna give you happiness. Uh, number two, don't get married and ruin somebody else's life. Where, where did I come up with that? Because that's what I saw. That's what I saw at home. That's what I saw in my friends' homes. And then number three, don't have children and ruin their lives on purpose. Well, that was a pretty bright outlook I had about life, wasn't it? Well, so th those were my conclusions. Well, what I didn't realize is even at that age, I was searching for some meaning in life. And I didn't, I didn't quite understand that at the time. Well, uh, you know, right about that time, we moved from one part of America to another. And where we moved to then, I, went, I was a junior in high school, which meant I had two years left of high school. And the, the high school that I went to, my particular class had a lot of Christians in it. I had never met Christians before. I didn't know any. Um, in my family, none of, none of the people that I know relation-wise were saved, at least not that I knew of. So I come into this new school and here's all these Christians. And they start talking about Jesus and sharing everything about him and, you know, salvation. And uh, I, I wasn't really very interested. You know, I, I'd seen life already by the time I was 15 and it was kind of ugly. And uh, so they're sharing things with me and I don't realize that God's trying to put these two things together. My searching and they have the answer and I can't do the math. So this goes on for two years and they're always inviting me to Bible study and uh, I'm saying no and giving reasons why Christians are weak and other things like that. I wasn't ugly about it, but I just didn't accept it. And, and a lot of my friends were Christians and they accepted me for who I was. And uh, <clears throat> so it came almost to the end of high school and uh, I was helping a friend build something for his dad. He, they had horses and we were building a little horse barn for uh, his dad. And so after school, you know, I'd kind of hurry out there and we'd work for a few hours before it'd get dark. And uh, so one day I had a doctor's appointment before going out there. And when I was coming down in the elevator uh, from the doctor's appointment, there was a man standing there and he just stood there and he looked at me with a funny look on his face the whole way down. You know, when you're 17, a 30 year old can look old, right? I don't remember how old he was, but he was older. And not like my age now, but older. So he just stares at me and you know, I, I say I'm unsaved and here's this guy giving me a funny look in the elevator all the way down. What would you think? That's what I thought too. So he follows me right out to the car. And I'm, you know, it was before key fob, so I'm putting my key in the car to unlock the door. And uh, he said, he's standing right there. And he says, excuse me, do you have a minute? I'd like to share something with you. I said, not really, but go ahead. And he said that Jesus changed his life and he would change mine. I said, whatever, got in the car and drove away. Feel bad about that today. So two weeks later, I want to hurry out to work, but I had stopped someplace in town real quick. I'm, I go to my car. I got the key in the car to unlock it. And there's a guy standing behind me. And he says, excuse me, do you have a minute? I'd like to share something with you. And I'm thinking, do I have a sign on my back? <laughs> well, I did spiritually. So, and he, and he said the exact same thing, that Jesus changed his life and he would change mine. I said, whatever, got in the car and drove off. But on the way out there that day to work, it got me thinking. 
And uh, so when he got to work, we were up on the roof that day putting shingles on the roof. And my friend happened to be the leader of the Christian Bible study that went on at school. And uh, so I, I said, hey, Jeff, I want to tell you about something that happened. And I told him what had happened. I said, isn't it a coincidence that two people would say the exact same thing in two weeks like that? He never looked up at me and he just said, yeah, that's a real coincidence. And I thought, hey, does he know something I don't know? Well, he knew a lot of things I didn't know. But before we left work that day, he said, hey, why don't you come to Bible study tonight? I said, you guys have been asking me that Bible study for two years, and I mumbled around a little, wouldn't commit. And he said, why don't you, will you come next week? I said, I'll come next week. And he said, you promise? And I said, if I said I will, I will. So the next week I went, and it was at one of the girls in our class house. Her dad was a doctor, and they had a nice big living room. And we walk in, and there's 70 kids in there. And I said, is there always this many people here? They said, no, not always. You know, so I, you know, I'd never been to a Bible study before. I don't know what they do. And uh, so there was a guy up there. He was from the college and he gave a testimony. I'd never heard a testimony before. And, you know, he asked if anybody wanted to receive Christ and I didn't raise my hand or anything. Well, I didn't find out till sometime later that that whole thing was planned for me because they'd been praying for me for two years. You know, and I, I was the, the atheist kid who uh, they'd been praying for. And then when I finally said I'd come, everybody came. They wanted to see what would happen. Well, I didn't receive Christ that night, but I did go back to the Bible study every week for, for seven years. We had that Bible study. It went on all the way through university. But anyhow, so I went the first week after we left, we got out of high school. And... Uh, the, the guy taught that night on, on who you are in Christ. Sounded like a foreign language to me. Who you are in Christ, what is he talking about? And I could tell my head didn't understand a thing, but it was like my heart was being pulled. And I went, I, I, had, I had moved out of my parents' house the day I graduated from high school. I didn't care if I had to live in a car, I didn't want to live in that house any longer. And uh, so I was in a dumpy little apartment with a couple other guys and I'm 17 years old and uh, so I laid in I went home that night and I laid in my own bed and I had my very first talk with God and I said okay God I will give you my life if you can change my life like every like these people said but if you can't change my life this is going to be a short experiment now, I don't think that made God nervous. That was my salvation prayer. That's how I received Christ. Now, I wouldn't recommend that that's how everybody do it, but that's how I did it. I did give my life to him that night. And you know what? Here we are. Michelle and I have been married for 41 years. We have three great kids, and we have love in our home. It's a... So I don't have any problem telling people that Jesus changed my life and he'll change their life. That is my testimony today. So, and then, you know, you get saved and then you want to find out, well, why am I here? Okay, God, you know, do you have something I'm supposed to do? It seems like it, but I didn't know very much. And so you, you go on and you try and find that out. And uh, so we're going to talk today. By the time you leave here, I can tell you why you're on the earth. Not specifically, but generally. Because your specific fits inside the general. So at least when you leave here today, you can say, I know why I'm here, breathing air. Even with a mask on, I know why I'm here, breathing air. And uh, so he, you know, he, the, the, the big answer to that though really is why, why are you here on the earth and what is God doing today on the earth? By the Holy Spirit, he's working through his body to build the church here on the earth. That's the simple answer. Now there's a lot more specifics in there. Um, the church has been going on for about 2,000 years, hasn't it? As far as we know, we're almost at the end of this age. Jesus is coming back for the church. But so the world today, the world is, is lost. It's hurting. It's dying. Um, even before this pandemic, the statistics were that like even in Japan, you know, the people are very separated, some in their living. 
and they said that there was an epidemic of people dying alone in their apartments and people didn't even know they were dead until they could smell it. That's how little interaction they were having with each other. In Europe, where we have spent most of the last 28 years, only 4% of the population is born again. There's 750 million people and only 4% of those that we figure are born again today. That's not very good. God wants to do something there. If there's 1% that's not born again, he wants to do something there. So what is God doing in the earth today? He's building his church and that's what we'll talk about. So the church today, Jesus and his body, the church, is the answer for the world today. They don't realize that if they did, they'd be here this morning. Now, some of you are watching online. We, we're thankful for that. You're part of this. But there's a whole world out there that isn't in watching online or in a good church today. You have a beautiful heritage here. And like my wife said, we have heard about you for years. We, we had some friends in Germany who came out from this ministry too, Jürgen and Rachel. And uh, so we'd heard about you for years, but never been here. And then Pastor JB, when we were coming here, he said, well, you should go and, and minister at the church and talk to the team. So we said, sure, we'd be happy to do that. Now, most Christians know that John 3, 16 and 17, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, you know, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. We know that. We know that he didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. We know that. So it's great that we know it, but not everybody knows it. That's why we're here is so we can spread that good news. It takes time. God's been building the church for 2000 years. He's not done yet. We are the ones that are here on the earth today. They get to build it during these last days. It takes time to build something. We lived in Heidelberg, Germany for some years. And Heidelberg has a very beautiful castle that sits up above the river. And it took 300 years for that castle to be built. 300 years. First, they had to dig out a hillside by hand. I mean, it's a mountain. And somehow, they dug it out by hand. That took a long time. So the person that had the vision for that castle never saw it completed. The one who designed it never saw it completed. And probably the next few generations never did either. 300 years to, to get it done. Brother Hagen is a good example of this. You know, he had, God had, a, had spoken to him in a vision and said, go teach my people faith. Well, that was something that was going to take more than a lifetime and more than him. It wasn't a me vision, it was a we vision, right? It included many more people. And Brother Hagen used to drive along in his car by himself going, how am I going to get this message out? How am I going to get this message out? Well, God had him start Rhema Bible Training Center, which is now Rhema Bible Training College. And that was part of the answer to how am I going to get this message out? Well, Brother Hagen died in 2003. And you know what? That message is going forth in a greater way today than it ever was when he was alive. Something, some God may want you to start something, you may not see it to the finish. Be why? Because it's bigger than you, it's bigger than me. But still we must play our part. How do great things get built? Well, one step at a time, isn't it? So I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 16. And uh, we're going to look at about uh, verse 13 through 18 there, 19. And I'm just going to, we can read, you can read along, but I'm just going to talk about these first few verses. Jesus is with his disciples. He, these were the guys that he said, come follow me, and they did, which I think is amazing. They left everything to come follow him. So they're walking along and Jesus was something, we call him the great master teacher. And great master teachers ask questions. Why? Because they want people to self-discover. They don't wanna just tell them everything, they want them to discover some things. And you can only do that if you ask questions that cause people to think. 
So he says, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And they said, some say you're John the Baptist or Elijah or one of the prophets. And uh, was that a correct answer? No, it wasn't correct. He didn't even correct them, though. He wanted to find out some information. What were people saying about him? Then he asked another question, and this one related to the ones that walked with him. And he said, but who do you say that I am? And we know Peter, he had the kind of personality that he spoke up sometimes before he thought. Now this time he gets it right. He said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says to him then, he goes, Simon Peter, he goes, blessed are you. He said, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven, right? He didn't get this because somebody else said something. He got it, it was a revelation to him. It was a revelation from God to him. He put the scriptures together. He did the math. And he saw, you know, from the scriptures that he knew that he was walking with the Messiah, the one that had been prophesied about for thousands of years. He had finally put that and said, this is him. He's here. So he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And as soon as that was declared, or revealed, he was revealed as the Christ, Jesus could then declare what he was going to do for the next 2,000 years. And he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now he didn't explain that at the time, but he did declare it. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And then he goes on in verse 19 and he said, you know, that I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you permit on the earth will be permitted in heaven. Different translations say that different way. But so he's as soon as, so let's put those together. As soon as he is declared as the Christ, the Messiah, then he says, I, he declares what's going to happen for the next 2000 years. And right away he tells him, and I'm giving you the authority to do it to build the church here on the earth. So why are we here? Jesus told us right there. We are here to build the church. Now, when a leader says I, what does that mean? That means we, you, us, they, them, all of us, right? We know that even from Exodus chapter uh, 31. And you don't have to turn there, but you, you can just write it down. This, the, you look through those chapters in Exodus chapter 25 through 31 or so, and it's talking about the building of a temporary tabernacle, which was a type of the church. And uh, they go through all the details of it. I mean, it's the kind of thing that when you're a young believer, you read it and you go, why did they put this in the Bible? If it's supernatural, I don't see it. Well, it takes a while. You got to put it together with the rest of scripture, don't you? And uh, so then you, you see that, you know, there was a lot of detail mentioned about that tabernacle. And then in chapter 31, the Lord speaking to Moses says, and I have anointed so-and-so, son of so-and-so. He named people and they were anointed. They were craftsmen, but they were also anointed. Craft, they were craftsmen, so they were skilled and anointed, not just anointed with no skill. Is God looking for people with skills so he can anoint them? Yes, he is. It's not just, sometimes we've heard, well, God isn't, you know, he's looking, you know, for your availability. He is, but he's also looking for some ability. And I'll get to that and why. So you get down there to verse 11 in chapter 31 of Exodus. And he says to Moses, he says, all that I have commanded you, they shall do. He didn't want Moses doing all of it. That would have taken him out of position of leading the children of Israel. And God had to teach him that lesson several times. But so whatever God tells, like in this case, Moses, he was going to take a lot of people to make it happen. Well, when Jesus said, I will build my church, how many people was that going to take? A lot, all of us, to get the church built on the earth. Do you think that's an important assignment? Absolutely, it's an important assignment. So, you, you know, you may not be able to share that with everybody, but what do you do? I build the church. That's what I do today. I know this for me, 
that when I am asked to minister somewhere, that what I'm going to speak about will center around the building of the church unless I have some other specific direction. I know that's a message that God has given me, uh, talking about building the church. So um, I just want to, we're going to look at four things here about building today, and we'll do that by looking at the life of Nehemiah. And um, so let's turn over to Nehemiah chapter one. God gave him a very interesting assignment, something that sounded very natural to rebuild a wall, but it led to something much greater. So we could say this, he was known for rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem, but this was God's way to start rebuilding faith in a nation. So how big of an assignment was that? I think that's what God did with Brother Hagin too. Go teach my people faith. And that was a commission to the entire world. Go teach my people faith. Why? Because he needed to build and rebuild faith in the world today, faith in God, faith in Christ. Because without that, people are lost. Um, so Nehemiah chapter one. So when we read about Nehemiah, don't just think about him, but think about you and what God has assigned all of us to do while we are here living on the earth. So these are the memoirs of Nehemiah. And in verse one, then it says this. In late autumn in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was at the fortress of Susa. Hananiah, one of my brothers, came to visit me with some other men who had just arrived from Judah. I asked them about the Jews who had returned there from captivity and about how things were in Jerusalem. They said to me, things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. Wow. So the report was not good. And we're gonna look at the reaction of Nehemiah to this report and what he does about it. Uh, it's, it's, so we find out that he has a concern for Jerusalem, the Israelites and that, that wall around the city. So he hears a bad report. So I wanna ask you this, when you hear a bad report, what is your reaction to that? We're gonna see what Nehemiah's was. But what is what has yours been? Now we had some bad reports this last year or so, didn't we? Did we freak out? Did we get scared? Did we go into fear? Did we go into hiding? <laughs> we, there were a lot of reactions we could have had. Now I know you didn't because you're here. But just in general, a question. So did we dwell on the, the evil report or the bad report? Or did we focus on God and, and what he had to say about it? So let's see what Nehemiah did. Verse four, he said, when I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted and prayed to the God of heaven. So the first thing he did when it came to the rebuilding of the wall, now he didn't know this yet, but the first thing he did was he prayed, right? God grabbed, Nehemiah, he, God grabbed Nehemiah's attention and, cause, and this caused him to pray. Now, sometimes I have to admit, I, my attention was grabbed and I didn't pray. I looked at it, I thought about it. You wondered about it, but did, the question was, did we pray about it? So in this case, though, Nehemiah did, it touched his heart. Prayer gives us the opportunity to clarify some things in a situation. Right? It takes us to God, not to the situation. Prayer will give us insight. Prayer will help us prepare for whatever this cause to rise up in our heart. Prayer should make our expectations to raise up. Years ago, when Michelle and I were fairly newly married, so we got married in October of 1980, and so sometime after that, we were around Tulsa and Brother Hagen had Monday night prayer meetings. And so we went. There was no Rhema Bible Church yet at that time, but Brother Hagen had prayer meetings. 
<clears throat> and we went. And so there was a whole season of time where sometime during the meeting or before we left, there was a map of the world up on the wall. And he'd say, stretch your hands up on the wall. We need to pray for Europe. And we did that. We prayed for Europe. We prayed about that iron curtain at the time. And so I don't know how long that was that we did that. But during that time, God tucked a seed in our heart. One word, Europe. So that was the, the beginning of forming a vision of something he wanted us to be a part of, something he wanted us to build. Now, we couldn't see all of it at that time. So what do you do when, when God puts something like that in your heart? And you know he puts something in there. Well, do you go just blab it out to everybody you know? No, that's why I, I like the word tucked, where he, he plants it in our heart. And when, when God plants a seed, or if you plant a seed, you can't see the, what happens for a while. It's under the dirt. It's covered. Why? It's giving it a chance to germinate and to take root, to start that before it comes up above the ground. So for years, we prayed about Europe. And then we, we helped people go to Europe. We'd give them a ride to the airport if that's what we could do. We picked up their mail for them when they were gone. We took care of their yard. We helped them with other things. Whatever we could do to keep ourselves pointed in that direction, we did. And so this went on for years. So it was probably 10 years or longer, or maybe 10 years, probably about. And every year we would say, you know, just ask God, should we take a trip to Europe? And it's not like he said anything, but if I, if I could put it this way, it was like he was standing there just doing this. You ever had that? Like, you just know it's not right to do yet. So we eventually went to pastor, and uh, there, was a, there was a group of people in that town that wanted a, a more word and spirit type of church. And so there was maybe 35 people, and they were looking for a pastor. We weren't looking for a congregation. And somehow God tricked us into it. And all of a sudden we were up there and we were pastoring. And on, when we were driving up there from where we lived, I can remember asking God, what does this have to do with Europe? He didn't really answer me. But, you know, it's kind of like, you know, this is the step. You know, we knew that it was the leading of the Holy Spirit. It, it, we had peace in our heart. It seemed right. So we did it. And, uh, you know, when you look back, you can just go, well, it makes all the sense in the world, right? You, looking back, we have 20-20 vision. So we went and we pastored there. And after we'd been there a number of years, we had an invitation to go to teach in some Bible schools in Europe. And, you know, he we said, well, we'll check, you know, because every, every year before that, we'd had this. So we, you know, kind of said, well, God, should we do this? And we didn't get this this time. Kind of got this. So we went and we went to Sweden. We went to the small nation of Estonia that had just come out from under the Iron Curtain. And then we took a trip to Germany for four days to visit some friends. And uh, when, when we left Germany and we were flying back over the North Atlantic, back toward the United States, we both knew that we were going to move to Germany. And so, you know, that took over 10 years for that part to form. So, you know, in the meantime, what could we do? We prayed. And we put our hand to something that was leading us in the direction of that, to keep our, our heart and our hand tied to something God had planted in here. That's what we could do. We didn't know too much, but we knew a little. So when you receive something in prayer, you know, you can pray for it. And if and not everything that touches your heart becomes an assignment in prayer, but some things do. And if you don't spend a little bit of time praying, how will you know whether it's an assignment or not? Whether God wants to keep you tied into it that way. So you start praying and you just keep praying as long as that is in there and turning that around and giving that back up to God. So in verses five through 10 in Nehemiah chapter one, um, Nehemiah realized some things needed to change in him first. <laughs> That's always true, isn't it? Something needs to change in me first. And we probably, that's probably why it took 10 years, because there were some things that needed to change in us. Part of it was growing up more. 
Now, Michelle had be, was a Christian from the time she was nine in a home with a spirit-filled mother who taught the word. I wasn't. So I had some growing to do. Uh, I had some changing to do. And both of us, our personality is much more introverted. If there was one thing I never wanted to do in life, it was stand up in front of people and talk. You can see how well that worked out for me. You know how much God cared about that? He didn't. He didn't care that I was an introvert and that I, was a, that I didn't want to speak in front of people. He just said, grow. Take steps of faith. And uh, so when I first started speaking, I had to, when I got up out of that chair and came to the front, I was like, God, you better be with me or you're going to be really embarrassed. <laughs> and I said that a long time. So... I figured it probably only took 20 some years for me to get kind of comfortable. That's probably real encouraging for some of you, isn't it? <laughs> now some people, they liked it from the time they were a kid to be up in front of people. Michelle and I just weren't that way. And so there was some growth that had to happen there in us too. We had to grow our personalities or develop our personalities so it fit with God's call. Because you can never use your personality as an excuse. Let me say that word again, never. You can never use your personality as an excuse why you can't do something for God. Because you can become all things to all people as you grow up in Christ. Spiritual growth is the cure to almost everything. That's why Paul spent so much time on it in his writings was about, you know, his main message was growing up spiritually because it cures just about everything. So Nehemiah made some changes. And then in verse 11, he says, O oh Lord, please hear my prayer. Listen to the prayers of those of us who delight in honoring you. Please grant me success today by making the king favorable to me. Put it into his heart to be kind to me. He said, in those days, I was the king's cupbearer. Now, this was a very important part of his prayer. And we find out as we read on. So Nehemiah heard the great need of Jerusalem and the walls, so he prayed. And it, like I said, for him it became an assignment. And that was the beginning of what he had, uh, of the steps he needed to take. So let's go to Nehemiah chapter 2. In verse 1, it says, early the following spring. So if I did the math right and my little bit of research right, this is approximately six months after he started praying. And, you know, it doesn't give us everything that happened in six months, but we know he prayed. So early the following spring in the month of Nisan, during the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was serving the king his wine. I had never before appeared sad in his presence. That's interesting and impressive, I would say. I'm not sure how long he'd been serving, but he knew he wasn't free to show his feelings. When you were before the king, you didn't wear your feelings on your sleeve. You came in with a certain presence all the time with joy, right? Not sadness. So he had never been sad in the king's presence before. What happened? So the king asked me, why are you looking so sad? You don't look sick to me. You must be deeply troubled. Then I was terrified. You know why? Because the king had the ability, the right, the power to just go have you get your head cut off if you came into his presence wrong. Now, aren't you glad God's not that way? Because we'd all be dead. <laughs> so... But when you came into the presence of this natural king, King Artaxerxes, that you came in with, in a certain way or you could be in big trouble. And you know, that must have happened or he wouldn't have been terrified. So what does he do? First thing he says, but I replied, long live the king. <laughs> right? He's not out for any bad for the king. Long live the king. He says, how can I not be sad for the city where my ancestors are buried is in ruins and the gates have been destroyed by fire? Now remember, he prayed for favor with the king. The king asked, well, how can I help you? So I prayed to the God of heaven, right? He prayed for favor and you know, now the king says, how can I help you? And this is something the king never had to ask. 
He never had to say to somebody, how can I help you? But he did because Nehemiah had favor. He had served him faithfully. And he said, what can I do for you? How can I help you? Now those words to somebody from the king, I mean, because you could then ask for anything. Didn't mean he would grant you anything, but you could ask for anything. So you should ask big, right? That's why when we're in the presence of God, you can ask big. You don't have to be afraid about what you ask for. So I, uh, I replied, if it pleased the king, and if you are pleased with me, your servant, send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. This is so outside the norm. He's the king's cupbearer, and now he's saying, send me to Judah and rebuild something? I mean, this is way outside where, what he should be asking for. The king with the queen sitting beside him, I think that's important, how long will you be gone? When will you return? After I told him how long I would be gone, the king agreed to my request. Oh my, how awesome was that? So now think about this. The old city of Susa in the Persian Empire was about 1,300 or, yeah, 1,370 kilometers away from Judah. This wasn't an afternoon walk. I mean, this is a journey, over 13, almost 1,400 kilometers away. That's how far away he was going to have to travel to do this. So it's not going to happen in a day or a week or a month. This is going to take a while. So what's something that we can tell from this? So we know that God put something in his, in his heart, an assignment. Not something small, like, well, yeah, this is just something I feel like God wants me to do, and it's boom, it's over. No, this is, a, this is an important assignment. So the first thing he did was pray, but we know by the time he talks to the king that something else had happened during the six month period. He had been planning, planning. He didn't just pray, he also planned. How do we know that? Because he goes on and tells the king exactly what he needs. I wonder sometime if this has been a missing element in our life. We pray, we pray, we pray, but do we plan? Here's something that we teach our teams. That when you know there's something you want to do, if it's start a new campus, if it's plant a church, if it's to have a seminar, make sure you do a budget. If you do the best possible job you can with how much it's going to cost, how many people it's going to take, where you're going to do it, and all those kind of things. Do the research. Plan. And it's amazing how when we pray and we plan, then the resources show up. Sometimes I think the reason they don't is because we haven't planned. So we're talking about building great things and accomplishing great things for God and finishing our part in what God started in building the church not just on our own, but together as a whole. So verse seven, I also said to the king, if it please the king, let me have letters addressed to the governors of the province west of the Euphrates River, instructing them to let me travel safely through their territories on my way to Judah. And please give me a letter addressed to Asaph, the manager of the king's forest, instructing him to give me timber. I will need it to make beams for the gates of the temple fortress, for the city walls, and for a house for myself. He was thinking, wasn't he? <laughs> and the king granted these requests because the gracious hand of God was on me. Well, you know what? You know who's already got favor with the king of kings and the Lord of lords? You do. You do. You have favor already. Right? God has graced you and favored you to build the church here on the earth. You don't even have to go ask for favor. It's already been given to us. We know that from Ephesians chapter one. So number one, we pray, but number two, it's obvious that he planned also because he asked for letters for the things that he would need. So he could have passage through, he could have the materials he needed. And um, so I, I, I say, one, sometimes I wonder if we stick with praying long enough so that our plan comes together. Now, does that mean that he had every detail down? No, he didn't. We'll see that too. Um, <clears throat> it 
So back to Nehemiah here. He had planned, and like I say, he may not have known the exact amount of lumber he needed. He's going to figure that out, but he knew he would need it. So number three then, we can say this. Well, number one was uh, pray. Number two is plan. Number three is evaluate. And evaluation is something that we're going to see is important right before we act or start or begin. You know, we can pray for the lost, but sometimes we're going to have to actually go out to them, aren't we? You know, the guy in the elevator and the guy that came up to me at the car, they put feet to their prayers. They'd probably ask God to use them. And you, and you know how it is. We've all done this. When God wants you to speak to somebody, sometimes, you know, you, you get drawn toward a person and you think, I don't know what to say. I don't know where to start this out. That what was on, that's what was on the face of that man in the elevator with me. God's dealing with his heart, but he doesn't know exactly what to say. That's why he had that look. I didn't know that then. I know it now because I've been that person. And, and so then you just, but you somehow have to speak it out. That's why he said, do you have a minute? I'd like to share something with you. I don't know if he knew what he was going to say next. And you may not either. But something will come out that will help people. And if, if nothing else, say that Jesus changed your life and he'll change theirs. And then see where it goes from there. If it was like me, they might reject you. I can't wait to get to heaven and meet those guys and say, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for being the guys that kind of were the final seeds that were planted to help me open my heart. I hadn't opened my heart before, but when those two men came along and planted those seeds and said, Jesus changed their life and he would change mine, say the exact same thing. That's what cracked my heart open finally. And, and you might be the person that plants that seed that either they don't crack it or they do, but it doesn't matter, it's a seed. I'd had hundreds of seeds planted before that that just stony ground. But finally, my heart cracked open and a seed got in there and it started to take root. And here we are all these years later. That was 1974. And look what God has done. He took a very shy boy and married a shy girl and let us do this in the world. You know what? And I, I won't say it, was, it wasn't always easy. It was steps of faith. That's why I'm glad we, we learned the message of faith so we could take steps of faith to fulfill an assignment that God gave us. And we're still working on that. So let's read on a little bit more. You know, God knows the end from the beginning, and he doesn't always tell us everything at the beginning, does he? When Michelle and I finally, you know, when we started doing what we're doing, we knew we were supposed to go to Europe and start a Bible school, and it wasn't Rama at that time. They weren't doing that. We did it in connections with some other people. And, <clears throat> you know, the, the only other thing after years of praying that we could verbalize besides Europe was, it seemed like we were gonna be working with smaller groups of people all over Europe. Well, that's not even an exciting vision. You know, who do you share that with? And they go, yeah, we'll join that. That's not exciting. Well, so 25 years later, you're down the road or, you know, and uh, I was sitting at graduation in Switzerland one time, one year, and, uh, you know, we got our robes on and I'm just waiting for my turn to get up and speak. And God speaks to my heart, you know, by the Holy Spirit, the way he does. Sometimes when you actually hear words, you know, that it's the exception, not the rule. But I heard this on the inside. He and he said, this is what I showed you 25 years ago. You know, and sometimes you get so busy doing the work of it, you forget that. And, you know, I was I had to hold myself from crying. Because you're thinking, wow, 25 years down the road, he goes, and this is what I, I showed you 25 years ago. And that was going all the way back to when Michelle and I first started going to those prayer meetings. So it takes a while for it to work. Um, when when our, our planning was minimal because we didn't know what to plan. <laughs> you know, we prepared ourselves and we helped other people. So let's read on here. <clears throat> 
Verse 9. It says, when I came to the governors of the province west of the Euphrates River, I delivered the king's letters to them. Uh, the king, I should add, I love that. Those should be in bold, I should add, had sent along army officers and horsemen to protect me. God is the one who does far above and exceedingly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. He had asked for something and the king gave him more. That's your king. That's your God. He'll give you more than you ask for. <laughs> I love that part of the verse. And I should add, he had sent along army officers and horsemen to protect me. But when Sanbalé and the Horonite and Tobiah, the Ammonite officials, heard of my arrival, they were very displeased that someone had come to help the people of Israel. That hasn't changed, has it? It's still the same spirit in the world today. You, you, you reach out to be a friend of Israel, to help Israel, and everybody comes against you. There's still people that aren't happy. So even with favor, we still have an adversary. Um, but we also have that authority, don't we? That's why, you know, the, the book that, the, another book that Brother Hagen wrote is called The Authority of the Believer, The Believer's Authority. And I think that you, you can find that here. The folks that came from Rama Kenya today that we'll get up and share afterwards, they have that book too. It's an important part of what our heritage has in the church. We know the authority that we have as believers today and you can't build the church without it. You have to know your authority in Christ and what he has given to us and what he is allowing us to do. We, we go forth with that authority. So verse 11, go down there. Nehemiah says, So I arrived in Jerusalem three days later. I slipped out during the night, taking only a few others with me. I had not told anyone about the plans God had put in my heart for Jerusalem. We took no pack animals with us except the donkey I was riding. So there is a time to keep some things in your heart. And then there's a time like, like Habakkuk said, write the vision, make it plain so others that Rita can run with it also. There comes a time for that. But so Nehemiah goes out and he inspects the walls and the gates. He, we could say this, he took a walk. He was evaluating. He hadn't had a chance to evaluate before. He prayed and he planned, but he couldn't see firsthand what was going on. Sometime you gotta make a trip and spy out the land. You gotta put your body where your vision or your calling is. We had to, you'll have to. Verse, go down to verse 17, because verse 13 through 16, it just talks about him walking around and uh, looking at the different gates and walking along the wall. But now I said to them, you know very well what trouble we are. And he's talking to the, uh, the leaders in, in Jerusalem. He says, but now I said to them, you know very well what trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Let us rebuild the wall and end this disgrace. So he gets done evaluating and now he says, it's time. We need to start. And so number four then is build or putting the plan into action. Verse 18 so number four, build or putting the plan into action. Verse 18, then I told them about how the gracious hand of God had been on me and about my conversation with the king. They replied at once, yes, let's rebuild the wall. So they began the good work. You know, it had to have been, uh, what's the word I want here? Um, impressive for one, but also encouraging to them to hear Nehemiah come. He, had, he was the cupbearer of the king. He was close to him. He knew the king and the queen. He'd been in their presence. And he comes along and then he tells them about how God had worked that situation out to release him from being the cupbearer to come there and rebuild. That must have been encouraging to them. And they said, yeah, let's go ahead and rebuild. They got behind that vision and said, let's, let's build. So they, they recognized the great opportunity that was before them. And I didn't say easy, I said great opportunity. Right, because verse 19, 
But when Sanballat and Tobiah the, and, and Geshem the Arab heard of our plan, they scoffed contemptuously. What are you doing? Are you rebelling against the king, they asked? They must have forgot about the letters already. I replied, the God of heaven will help us succeed. We, his servants, will start rebuilding the wall, but you have no share, legal right, or hysteric, or hysteric, historic claim in Jerusalem. I love how bold he was about that. He goes, you have nothing in this, but we do. So God's plans do not come without opposition from the enemy. Every great opportunity will probably have great opposition. So let's know that in advance. Let's prepare for it in advance. And that's where our hearts have to be prepared. When this pandemic was announced this last year, you know whose heart was prepared and whose wasn't. Now, if yours wasn't and you had time to get it prepared, you, you heard the word, you got to the right place. But a lot of people were prepared ahead of time. It didn't phase them at all. There was no fear. There was no worry about it. You know, we knew who we are. We know that the greater one lives in us. We know that that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us and it quickens our mortal body, right? By his stripes, we were healed. We knew that. There was no fear there about what was going on. So we knew we had the authority to make it through that. We knew we had God's will to make it through that. So um, when Jesus said, I will build my church, he also said, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So that's why I say that the, the knowledge and the understanding of the believer's authority is a key to building the church here on the earth. It's not the only key, but it is a great key. And that's what our assignment is, is to build. <clears throat> we are builders. Nehemiah was a builder. You are builders. Look at what you've done here. You know, you're not done yet, but look at what you've done. That's encouraging right there. And what you see on this property isn't all of it, is it? You have, you have the, the, where the children are, the children's home. So what's God doing here? Just building a church so that we have a place to show up on Sunday or Wednesday? No. Why did he plant this church? Why did Brother Jerry have the vision for some of this and you all are carrying it on? Because God is building the church and he's building and rebuilding faith in this nation. You're not just rescuing children. You're providing a place where you can disciple and grow future leaders and champions for this nation. Rescuing just seems to be the first part, but it's not the biggest part of the picture. God wants to do something with the kids from that, that place. They, they now have an advantage where before they had a disadvantage. And he's taking them out of where they were and put them into a place, you know, in, into a pot that is with perfect soil, the right temperature, the right amount of water, so they can grow and flourish like they never could have before. That's what this church is for you too. It's, it's a place where you can grow and flourish, fulfill the will of God, build this church so it affects a city, a region, and a nation. Because you are building faith and rebuilding faith in the nation. When you read on in Nehemiah, because we only looked at a little bit at the first two chapters, when you read on through the chapters, you know, you go through the great opposition that they faced. And it was one thing after another for a while when they were building that wall where finally half of them were standing with, with swords and then the, even the ones building made sure they had a sword on. They're building with one hand and got a sword in the other. That's how, cl how close things were to always being dangerous. But they didn't stop and they completed the wall, didn't they? And, and we can see then that Nehemiah's presence there and rebuilding that wall started to build faith. And you know what it did? They started reading the word of God together again as a nation. That's the beautiful thing about it, that it made a way for that. The wall was just a wall. And could it provide protection? Yes, but it was a catalyst to do something greater. That's what this church in the children's home is. It's a catalyst to do something greater. It's to use our voice 
into this city, into this region, into this nation, so that faith is built. Faith in God. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 3.10. He says, according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it, but let each one take heed how he builds on it. We're building on that today, aren't we? But I love the way he used that. He said, I have been graced to be a wise master builder. If you're building a building or a home, who do you want? The master builders or the, have the kindergarten class come over? You want the master builders. That's who God wants us to be. That's why, he, that's why Paul prayed in Colossians that we would be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. He was, I think he got those words from Exodus 31 where it was talking about the temporary tabernacle where all, every detail, the clothing, the, the tables, the, the utensils, everything was described in great detail. And you, you, when you read it, you go, why? Because he was talking about the church and the detail and how concerned he was that the church was built right and that it was built strong. That's the picture he wanted us to get from that. As a young believer reading through there, I'm going, what is this here for? When I read it later on as a Christian, I go, wow, now I see why you put that in there. You're expounding on some of these things for us. So then Paul prays because Paul had a revelation of the church. Jesus said, I will build the church. But Paul was the one who got the revelation of what that was and then described it to the body of Christ. He prays those prayers in Ephesians 1 and 3, Colossians 1, Philippians 1. And we call those prayers of supplication. What is a prayer of supplication? It means I have seen something with the eyes of my heart, not just these eyes, but the eyes of my heart. I've seen something and I want you to see it too. So he prayed those prayers. That's why he prayed those. And then it's a short prayer. And then he expounds on that prayer in all the rest of his writings. He teaches us out of that. It's like an outline of what he teaches us so that we will get the, uh, the revelation and the understanding about growing up spiritually and building the church here on the earth. It is the main thing that God is doing in the earth today. Now, too often, too often, too often, the church looks at itself as second-class citizens. It's exactly the opposite. God created the earth and everything that's in it. We are his children. I think when God looks at the earth, he sees two groups of people, not by color, not by little colored borders around a country, but he sees those who are in his family and those who he wants in his family that haven't come in yet. And so sometimes he sends somebody to another part of the world so that they can help the family grow. That's what he did with us. I think it's very simple that way. So the vision and the assignment that Nehemiah was given by God was much greater than building a wall. The assignment that you have is much greater than just building a home or a church. It's about rebuilding faith in this nation and in the world. That's a big assignment, everybody. But I believe that's why he's called you to do the things he has called you to do. Sometimes we don't see it on, uh, on the surface because it just seems like work. But that work is producing something. Whether you're running cameras or sound or the worship, it's all a very important and integral part of what God is doing. I don't know if you've ever heard this story, but it, there's a story about a man that's in Europe years ago when these big cathedrals are being built. And they're, they're huge, they're massive. You, you look at them today and it's, you still go, wow. And so he, the story goes that he's walking and there's a wall being built. And he says to the first man, what are you doing? And the guy looks up at him with a funny look on his face and he goes, I'm building a wall. Okay, 
So he walks on down the wall further and he asks the exact same question to a man, what are you doing? And the man looks up with pride and he said, I'm building a cathedral. There's a big difference there, isn't there? One's got a job, one's got a calling. We, you and I have been called to do something here on the earth. And you may think that you're the least person that God would use, but don't think about it that way. If you're willing, you've consecrated your life to him and you continue to grow, he will find a way for you to be used in a way that will amaze you. He will find a way. He will take you places that you never thought you would go. He will have you speak to people that you never thought you would speak to. But he will do that. And you can say, well, I don't even know if that's my desire. It wasn't ours either. I'm a homebody. I don't even care if I go anywhere. <laughs> See how well that worked. Because it was not our will, but his will. Now, you may never leave this area. That's fine. Because then you know your assignment is here to help build this local church because it's going to reach out to the world. So that's what you can help do. I want to encourage you in this. Find any way you can to put your hand to building the church. Because it'll make a difference in many lives, not just now, but down the road. God has given this place an assignment. And it is very, very important that it be done. If you got more things to build physically, build them. Whatever it takes to do that. Help which, however you can. Um, I know this. Michelle and I found this out from our own life. That you may see something way down the road and you don't know how you're going to get there. And it may be 25 or 30 years away. Could be that long. We don't know we can see that far. But what we found out in our own life, if we would just keep a passion for building the church, that we didn't care what we did, we weren't looking for a title, but we just wanted to be a part of building the church and we wanted to grow and become better leaders. That if we would just keep that in mind, God could steer us and get us to wherever he needed to. Right? We didn't have to walk over people, try and get a position. We never needed to do that. God will make a way for you. So simply keep a passion for building the church. It doesn't matter what you do. When you start out, it matters more the further you go on. But it doesn't matter in the beginning. You just, what do you need me to do? We ask one of the leaders, what do you need me? to do. I tell this story sometimes, and I'll finish with this. Um, <clears throat> when we were living in Germany, they, uh, our trash got picked up. You know, the trucks would come by on Wednesday morning very early. So Tuesday night, you had to get the trash out. So if I called up the stairs to our kids, you know, kids, uh, collect the trash and bring it down. If I heard them say, Dad, we don't really feel led to do that. Or, Dad, we don't sense any anointing with the trash. <laughs> or, Dad, um, we'll pray about it. I would have said, I will be right up there to pray with you so you feel led. <laughs> you will feel the anointing. <laughs> Why? You know what? There's just some, that, there's some things that are family business that you don't need to pray about. You don't need an anointing for. You don't need to feel led. You just say yes. yes. And you do them because it's family business. Yes. You know, in our office, you know whose job it is to take out the trash? Everybody's. If your trash can's full, take it out. We don't have a, we don't have a designated person for that. You just pick it up when it's full. Now, some offices may have that. Nothing wrong with that. But that's when we started out in the office, that's what we did. Because we didn't want people thinking that it wasn't their job. You know, don't wait for it to fall off the edge, just take it out. You don't need to pray about it. You don't need to feel led, just do it because it's family business, folks. Amen. Thank you for watching the Victory Faith Church YouTube channel. We hope you are blessed by the message today. Please share your testimony with us by visiting victoryfaithchurch.online slash testimony and tell us how God has been good to you. 
Don't stop here. Join us live every Sunday by subscribing to this channel and clicking the notification bell so that you don't miss a single video or live stream. Please share this video with a friend that they may also be blessed. Thank you once again for watching. God bless you and see you next time.